I'm Gene Clavin. Can you give us a minute of your time and drop us a line at Arts Minute, Radio City Station, P.O. Box 1277, New York, New York, 10019. Anything you like on arts, write and tell us. Here's the address. Arts Minute, Radio City Station, P.O. Box 1277, New York, New York, 10019. If you know of a special event you'd like mentioned on Arts Minute, write to us. Arts Minute, Radio City Station, P.O. Box 1277, New York, New York, 10019. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. If you don't have a pen or pencil nearby, then please get one, because a little later this evening, I'd like to give you a special address. Thanks for getting that pen or pencil, because now you can write to us at Arts Minute. Arts Minute, Radio City Station, P.O. Box 1277, New York, New York, 10019. The 80s are boom years for American museum construction, and one of our best-known ones is preparing for an onslaught of increased attendance. It's the fourth time in two generations that the Museum of Modern Art, known to its friends as MoMA, has enlarged its capacity. Early in January of this year, all exhibitions were shut down. But don't worry, the museum reopens in temporary space on March 31st with a show of more than 100 works created between 1911 and 1917 by Giorgio de Chirico, who influenced the Surrealists. This runs to the end of June. Longtime MoMA fans will discover the museum's temporary entrance is now on West 54th Street. The museum garden is closed during the renovation, but it will reopen when MoMA's new space is all finished. And old-time movie buffs take heart. A new MoMA theater, the Roy and Yuta Titus Auditorium, opens in June with part two of the series Rediscovering French Film. This is Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. What do you call perfection? Well, if you play the violin, you might say Stradivarius. No one made violins like that native of Cremona, Italy, Antonio Stradivari. And the Fort Worth Symphony has acquired two called the Davis and the McKenzie after their owners. Priceless violins. Well, not exactly priceless. A Fort Worth oil executive paid over $250,000 for the Davis, made in 1710. The McKenzie, made in 1685, was purchased by another music lover, and both violins were donated to the symphony for use by the leaders of the first and second violin sections. This is a treat at a time when more and more strads end up in museums and private collections. And we've got a treat for you violin lovers. The sound of a strad. Stradivari made his last violin nearly 250 years ago, and only 600 or so are left. His original design has been duplicated, but no one has ever created a sweeter sounding instrument. I'm Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. That master of comedy, Charlie Chaplin, once said, all I need to make a comedy is a park, a policeman, and a pretty girl. He began an English music hall and worked in a comedy troupe which included a young Stan Laurel. Eventually, he came to America where he worked for Max Sennett, the creator of the Keystone Cops. Sennett's filmmakers never wrote scripts. They made up their plots on the wing and on those drafty, crazy outdoor sets was born a cinema that life itself seemed to imitate. And who has the courage to play Charlie Chaplin? John Rubinstein plays Charlie in a new musical. And he should know about playing legendary figures. He was raised at the knee of one. Famed pianist Artur Rubinstein is his father, and undoubtedly a proud father he was to see his son's touching performance in Children of a Lesser God. Chaplin covers the Tramp's music hall days and is scheduled to open in Boston March 25th. Should reach Broadway at the beginning of May. I'm Gene Clavin for Arts Minute.
Well, if you wanted to assemble some of the brighter lights of the American arts in the 60s, you'd probably include Lichtenstein, Rauschenberg, Oldenburg, and Warhol. That's exactly what Leo Castelli has done for the 25th anniversary of his New York gallery, an institution which has brought international attention to American painting and sculpture since the 60s. You remember the 60s. In addition to everything else that was going on, it was difficult to keep up with the changing aesthetic schools. We had conceptual art, pop art, plus the more familiar types of abstraction. Artists were constructing gigantic clothespins. They were creating all black or all white canvases, or they were filling spaces with light. And beer cans were considered artistic subjects. So was Marilyn Monroe. The Castelli exhibit will tour in five museums and galleries around America through the next year. I'm Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. When the concert goers attended the opening of London's new Barbican Center, they might have imagined the clash of gladiators, swords, or the thunder of chariots, as they were sitting on at least eight centuries of cultural history. The $260 million art complex, the largest in Western Europe, is built on some of the oldest Roman ruins in London, the Barbican or City Wall. This year, it becomes home for the London Symphony and the highly respected Royal Shakespeare Company. Since Roman times, the area has seen drastic demolition and rebirth. The Barbican Center revitalizes a part of London ravaged in World War II. In the opening season, Sir Michael Tippett and Hans Werner Henze concertize at the center. And under the direction of Trevor Nunn, the Royal Shakespeare Company performs Henry IV. Nunn recently directed Nicholas Nickleby, both in London and New York. So, an exciting first year is in store for Barbican. I'm Gene Claven for Arts Minute. Igor Stravinsky's music is enjoyed by millions of concert goers today, but just a half century ago, the Rite of Spring provoked its first Paris audience to shouting matches and indescribable tumult. This June marks the 100-year anniversary of Igor Stravinsky's birth. And all year long, special events will honor the man who created musical possibilities that new composers still explore today. He said he would have liked to live a quiet life like Bach, yet he found the excitement of his times irresistible. He wrote ballets for Diaghilev, The Firebird, Petrushka, The Rite of Spring, Les Nos. Picasso and Cocteau did stage sets for him. And his austere and eloquent ballet, Orpheus, was commissioned by Lincoln Kirstein for George Balanchine to choreograph. The New York City Ballet has planned a series of Stravinsky ballets for its spring season. And the L.A. Philharmonic will feature a two-week festival of the composer's works this coming June. I'm Gene Claven for Arts Minute. If you're traveling in the Carolinas this summer, you can enjoy a fine blend of Southern hospitality and two of the most exciting summer arts festivals around. Charleston, South Carolina plays host to the renowned Spoleto Festival in late May. John Carlo Minotti began the festival in Italy where it still continues. This is its sixth year in Charleston and events include concerts with Pincus Zuckerman and Eric Leinsdorf, the New York Philharmonic and a dance program you won't want to miss. It features the legendary Jose Limon Company, the Oakland Ballet as well. Drive on up to Durham, North Carolina, and you'll catch the American Dance Festival. In June and July, they'll feature some of the most original artists in American dance, like Merce Cunningham, the innovative Paul Taylor Company, plus the Alvin Nikolai Company. And as a special feature this year, the festival also presents four modern dance companies from Japan. The festival runs June 13th through July 24th in Durham. I'm Gene Claven for Arts Minute. The Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York is rounding out its already extensive collections with a new one of primitive art from the Americas, Oceania, and Africa. These rare works of art will be housed in the new Michael C. Rockefeller Wing. The Met has seen many changes with the recent additions of the American Wing, the Sackler Wing, and the Chinese Garden. 
The new wing represents a real opportunity for museum goers to view compelling art from geographically remote regions of the world. Some of the items on exhibit include a nose ornament from the first century AD, possibly from Peru. A seated wooden figure from the Mayan culture created sometime before the ninth century AD. This beautifully worked helmet from oceanic Melanesia and this mask adorned with cowrie shells from the Cameroon. There are nearly 2,000 unusual objects of art on display at the recently opened Michael C. Rockefeller Wing. If you're in New York, it's a great show to catch. I'm Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. I'm Gene Clavin, and I'd like to introduce you to a new feature on Arts, Arts Minute. Several times each week, we'll be right here to inform you, amuse you, and let you in on some exciting new events in the arts. Arts Minute will keep you up to date with previews on dance and music from the classic to the contemporary. Prose, poetry, painting, film, and theater from the experimental to the traditional. Whatever you need to know that's fresh and different. And we won't sidestep controversy either. Every so often, we'll sling a few arrows at the outrages of fortune, like art theft, movies, uh, popularity of classical versus rock music. Since you'll be hearing from us, we'd like to hear from you. If you'd like Arts Minute to report on your community, perhaps you're having an important art show, a theater performance, or concert, just write to us here at Arts, care of Post Office Box 1277, Radio City Station, New York, New York, 10019. I'm Gene Claven for Arts Minute. Frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a damn. When Clark Gable was supposed to tell off Vivian Lee in Gone with the Wind, they had to fight like hockey players to keep the expletive in the film to emphasize the human relationship. They don't care much about human relationships in films today. When they arrive at an impasse between two people, the chances are they'll solve it by a car crash, a machine gun from a helicopter, or an omen that makes the baby's head spin 360 degrees. Most of us can't solve our problems that easily. But some filmmakers have been watching too much television where problems have to be settled in time for the sponsor's message. In their movies, an in-law who threatens a marriage is crushed by a falling hotel. They'll take out a whole neighborhood with an oil derrick fire to avoid the dilemma of children in a second marriage. In real life, when somebody says the devastating words, I don't love you anymore, we don't deal with it by bombing Denver. In the movies, there's a lot of car crashing, but real passion is out of fashion. I'm Gene Clavin. Why do you think American kids are afraid of classical music? Maybe it's because of those melancholy announcers with the wired jaws and the good music stations, or those uptight teachers and critics who want us to think music was discovered on flaking scrolls in shrines in Vienna or Verona. Perhaps some of those people want to keep it in their own domain. Good music is too good for the rest of us. People who created so-called good music years ago were as loony, sexy, driven, jealous, hilarious as their wacky modern counterparts. Just suppose, suppose radio records and TV had been invented in the eras of Mozart, Beethoven, and Mendelssohn. They would have turned up on every talk show, awards program, in every gossip magazine. Strauss and Mahler would have been battling for record contracts and spots on the top 40 charts. Teenagers would have been chasing them, wigs flying in the breeze. Imagine what Rona Barrett would have done with Chopin and Georges Sand. They were real people, those people. Their concerts were concerts like ours, not ceremonies. Pass it on to the kids, will you? I'm Gene Clavin. I'm Gene Claven. I want to introduce you to a new arts feature, Arts Minute. Arts Minute will be telling you what's going on around the world, around the country, maybe even your city. We'll cover just about every activity in the arts that we can think of, and you'll be the best informed person on the block. This is the second year of arts in most parts of the country, but it's our first time in Manhattan, and we want to welcome you new subscribers in Cable Land to the opening night of arts. From time to time on arts, I'll be giving you some mini editorials which represent my own view on the arts. So since you'll be hearing from me, let me hear from you. If there's some wonderful concert, some fiesta that's going on, something you'd like the rest of the world to know about, or you just want to know about, here's an address you can write. Arts Minute, 
Radio City Station, Post Office Box number 1277, New York, New York, 10019. So write, but don't send criticism. It depresses our entire staff, and it costs a lot of money these days. You know, it's too bad we don't do more to honor our national treasures. I'm talking about people, not landmarks. The Japanese have a 30-year tradition. Once a year, they honor their greatest artists by calling them living national treasures. The award's gone to artists who preserve cultural traditions, like the grand kabuki actors and some of Japan's master craftsmen. 66 artists have been honored so far. We ought to have something like that. So, for many candidates, here's my first list, all of them part of the American culture by now. Georgia O'Keeffe whose paintings evoke images of the American West. She's 95. Louise Nevelson, creator of mysterious black and white boxes and environments. She's 82. Marian Anderson, the first black American to sing at the Metropolitan Opera. She's 80. And George Balanchine, 77, a legendary choreographer whose career spans ballet to Broadway. All of them modern masters certainly treasures. Let's salute their presence and their contribution. Jean Clavin for Arts Minute. Pavarotti wants me to sing. A lot of us secretly think we're just as good as he is. Nineteen young folks are going to be lucky enough to realize a great ambition to sing with Luciano Pavarotti. They're winners of the Pavarotti International Voice Competition. The contestants were auditioned by a distinguished panel of judges, including Pavarotti, who came and said, I want them. Then, for about a year, the winners receive special training to prepare for the most exciting part of the contest. Because it's not enough that they get to sing before Pavarotti or with people who know Pavarotti, but they will actually appear on stage with Pavarotti in three performances of Puccini's La Boheme and two performances of a Donizetti opera, Le Lisier d'Amore. You may say, isn't that wonderful? Why didn't you tell me this sooner? I'm sorry you didn't know about it. I'm sure you would have been chosen. I know I would. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. Isn't this gorgeous, or not so gorgeous, depending on your view of Art Deco? This is Radio City Music Hall, and it's celebrating its 50-year anniversary. We're lucky it's open at all, as a matter of fact, because this architectural monument and movie palace very nearly went out of business. It's the last vaudeville movie house in America, probably. But times have changed, and they've renamed it the Radio City Music Hall Entertainment Center. Now they present everything here from rock concerts to film premieres, like Napoleon, and of course, the Rockettes. They were originally called the Missouri Rockets. Then they changed the name to the Roxyettes because they were appearing at the Roxy Theater in New York. Since the 30s, more than 250 million people have seen the Rockettes, and no one has ever accused them of being great dancers. But they are a great tradition. And in large part, thanks to them, the era of great entertainment on the great stage goes on, let's hope, at least another 50 years. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. You know, there are some actors who say, I'd like to stretch my art every once in a while and go back to the stage. If only I could give up the money I make in movies and soap operas. The truth of the matter is that there are some of them who do return to the stage, and one place they're doing it is the Stratford Festival, just a couple of hours from Toronto by car. Now, some people say nothing ever goes on in Canada except constitutional changes and people saying oot and a boot. Well, some of the biggest names have appeared on the Stratford stage, starting with Alec Guinness and Irene Wirth in 1953. Even then, it was just a couple of hours from Toronto by car. This year, Len Cariou, who's just marvelous as Sweeney Todd, will be doing Shakespeare and Shaw at Stratford, and Carol Shelley from The Elephant Man, and Tammy Grimes, who did 42nd Street, will be paired in Noel Coward's beautiful play, Blythe Spirit, all happening June 7th through October 23rd, a couple of hours from Toronto by car. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute.
Welcome to Miami Beach. Miami's gotten some pretty bad press lately. I think we ought to give it some good publicity and talk about the New World Festival of the Arts. It runs for three weeks in June and it's just a whale of an event. I don't know of any other that gives you 26 world premieres. They're serious about this. They've gone to the trouble to commission some new works, especially for the festival. This year, they'll have new plays by Tennessee Williams, Edward Albee, and Lanford Wilson, who, as you know, wrote Tally's Folly. And they'll be presenting Robert Ward's opera, Minutes Till Midnight, certainly a first for opera, because it's about a nuclear scientist who discovers the secret of cosmic energy. There's more. The Israel Philharmonic and the great dancers Cynthia Gregory and Miami's own Fernando Bujonis. It's called the New World Festival of the Arts. I certainly hope that you can get there because it's a marvelous festival. Lots of sun, lots of fun, lots of festival. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. The oldest dance festival in the United States is the one they call Jacob's Pillow. It's close to Tanglewood, the music festival in the Berkshires. Now, where did they get the name Jacob's Pillow? More on that in a moment. About 30,000 dance lovers come to the Pillow each year, and it's been home to some fantastic world premieres in its 50-year history, like Ruth St. Dennis, Alvin Ailey, and other great stars. This summer, the Pillow is presenting the Royal Danish Ballet, the Paul Taylor Company, and some Japanese dancers on tour here in America for the first time. It's all near Tanglewood. How do you get there? Very simple. It's in the western part of Massachusetts in the Berkshires. Now, why is it called Jacob's Pillow? The name comes from a large rock on the festival property, which is near Jacob's Ladder, part of the route for runaway slaves on their way to Canada. I bet you think we didn't know that. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. I want to give a picture of Dublin so complete that if the city one day disappeared from the face of the earth, it could be constructed out of my book. Ulysses, all the action, the portrait of a man, a woman, a town, detailed, so it must fit a lifetime of impressions into a single day. Reading, reading, reading. They're gonna be reading James Joyce's Ulysses, the book, nonstop on Irish radio. Uninterrupted, reading the whole book, broadcast 24 hours in Dublin. Tours, they're gonna sponsor walking tours, reenactments. The book will be seen to live again. Molly, Leopold, living, loving again in reenactment in Dublin. And in the United States, in the United States at the New York Public Library, an exhibition of memorabilia from the Paris days. Portrait of the artist in Paris at the University of Vermont, a three-day conference in April. In Pittsburgh, a four-day festival in June, all honoring Joyce's 100th birthday. Will you enjoy it? Yes, you will. Yes, you will, yes. Yes, you will. Gene Clavin saying, Arts Minute. They call him the King of Swing. At the start of his career, he said, if I'm gonna flop, I'd rather do it playing my own kind of music. So he played what he liked, and what do you know, everybody else liked it too. Benny Goodman has got to be one of the most enduring figures on the music scene. It might surprise you to know he has a strong background in classical music. As a matter of fact, he made his debut at the age of 10 playing a work by Haydn. But he was playing jazz gigs when he was 14. By the 1930s, he fronted about the most popular big band in America. He introduced Billie Holiday and Peggy Lee, and in that incredible career, Bartok, Hindemith, and Copeland all composed important clarinet works for him. Benny Goodman, truly one of the world's great musical talents. Later this spring, he's got about six appearances around the country with his sextet. After that, he tours Europe and then returns for more concerts here. But next year, he expects to be busy. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. They call him the King of Swing. At the start of his career, he said, if I'm gonna flop, I'd rather do it playing my own kind of music. So he played what he liked, and what do you know, everybody else liked it too.
During his incredible career, he introduced the remarkable Peggy Lee. If you had prepared 20 years ago, you wouldn't be a wonder now from door to door. Why don't you do that? Later this spring, he's got about six appearances around the country with his sextet. After that, he tours Europe and then returns for more concerts here. But next year, he expects to be busy. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. There is so something the post office does well. Designs postage stamps. Once you had to be a president to get on a stamp, but now lots of things go on commemorative stamps. You remember this version of the love stamp? Well, there's a new one with a romantic design. Who designs stamps anyhow? The Citizens Stamp Advisory Council recommends stamps and artists that change with the times. Like in 1967, they issued a Henry David Thoreau stamp, which was very apropos for the 60s. Now, most of us are thinking less about Walden Pond and more about money. So they came out with a Joseph Wharton stamp depicting the founder of the Wharton School of Business. A 20 cent stamp might be as valuable as a Jackson Pollock someday, and you don't need as large a frame to display it. You can also put your stamps on letters addressed to us here at Arts Minute. We want to hear your suggestions. So write to us at Arts Minute, Radio City Station, Post Office Box 1277, New York, New York, 10019. I'm Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. There isn't anything the Europeans have that we don't have. The arts, the intellect, the pretension, the expensive skiing. You'll find all these things at Aspen, Colorado, because it's Switzerland and America. The place didn't begin as a ski area. There was just gorgeous countryside out there till about 1945, when an industrialist decided to turn the town into a cultural center. It's best known for the annual Aspen Music Festival and Music School. Many people have played there from Yitzhak Perlman to Victor Borga. The festival begins June 25th this year, and events include Robert Shaw conducting the Aspen Orchestra in Beethoven's Missa Solemnis. But Aspen isn't just music. This summer, the Aspen Center for the Visual Arts is exhibiting works of the artists represented by New York art dealer Leo Castelli, and the Pilgrim Theater is home to the Aspen Playwrights Conference. Ask about performance schedules when you get there, and send us a card, please. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. What's your guess for the most heavily attended museum in the country? The Metropolitan Museum in New York? The National Gallery in Washington, D.C.? The Institute of Fine Arts in Chicago? Well, you're right. It's the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. About 10 million people go there each year, and if you haven't seen it, you may be wondering why it's so popular. One reason might be that people have always been obsessed with flight since Icarus and the Wright brothers, who were slightly more successful. The museum has the original Kitty Hawk flyer and Lindbergh Spirit of St. Louis, a moon rock you can touch, and a theater with a fantastic five-story movie screen with continuous shows all about flight. And if you're interested specifically in astronauts and space travel, you want to see the National Air and Space Museum's latest exhibit. Open as of July 1st, it's called 25 Years of Space Exploration. It covers everything you'd want to know about Sputnik, the Viking lander, and the space shuttle. Oh, by the way, it's okay to bring the kids along, too. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. What's your guess for the most heavily attended museum in the country? The Metropolitan Museum in New York? The National Gallery in Washington, D.C.? The Institute of Fine Arts in Chicago? Well, you're right. It's the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. About 10 million people go there each year, and if you haven't seen it, you may be wondering why it's so popular. One reason may be that people have always been obsessed with flight since Icarus and the Wright brothers, who were slightly more successful. The museum has the original Kitty Hawk flyer and Lindbergh's Spirit of St. Louis, a moon rock you can touch, and a theater with a fantastic five-story movie screen with continuous shows all about flight. And if you're interested specifically in astronauts and space travel, you'll want to see the National Air and Space Museum's latest exhibit. Open as of July 1st, it's called 25 Years of Space Exploration. Covers everything you'd want to know about Sputnik, the Viking lander, and the space shuttle. And it's okay to bring the kids along, too. 
Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. toward the Hudson River, sweep down its eastern bank for 140 miles, flash briefly by the long red row of tenement houses south of 125th Street, dive with a roar into the two and one half mile tunnel which burrows beneath the glittering swank of Park Avenue, and then Grand Central Station, center of a fantastic metropolis. And subject of a gigantic exhibition at the New York Historical Society. The station was constructed in 1913 and has been an architectural treasure ever since. Incidentally, in 1975, a developer wanted to demolish it to make way for a new building, but citizens and architects protested and won. The issue was the first major test of the Landmarks Law. The Municipal Art Society exhibition explores Grand Central's influence on the economic and social life of New York. It runs May 27th through October 3rd at the New York Historical Society. Later, it tours around the country. I'm Gene Clavin. All aboard! Back in a minute, y'all. Atlanta has already broken ground for its major new high museum of art on Peachtree Street. Any architect has to adapt his design to the existing site. Richard Meyer, the high museum architect, couldn't knock down everything around and build some kind of pyramid, and he couldn't cut down all the peach trees that give Peachtree Street its name. His design had to fit in the existing area, which it does very nicely, thank you. If you've always wanted to see an open, airy museum design, you're in luck because the High Museum's galleries are connected by an atrium, a glassed-in courtyard, and you can look right across from one gallery to another. The museum will house permanent collections from early Italian and Renaissance to 20th century art. There's also an auditorium and classrooms. It looks to be a highly successful design for Meyer, a fine cultural magnet for Atlanta, and it should be done by the fall of 1983, if the electricians show up on time. I'm Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. What's an Opry House doing in Santa Fe? Why not Albuquerque, New Mexico, or Truth or Consequences, New Mexico? The main reason is that John O. Crosby, the man who started the opera company, fell in love with the area. The early history of the state is pretty colorful because it was a watering hole for major cowboys like Gene Autry, John Wayne, and William S. Hart. But by 1957, about the only people you'd find wearing chaps and ivory handle six shooters were in the Santa Fe Opera. It's a great company with a reputation for introducing new stars. Ashley Putnam has sung La Traviata there. Richard Stilwell and Frederica von Stade appeared, as have so many others. They're very proud of their world premieres. One coming up is George Rockberg's The Confidence Man, based on Herman Melville's evocation of 19th century America. In the same upcoming season, they're doing The Marriage of Figaro and Deflator Mouse as well. So today, when we talk about the Santa Fe stage, we don't mean the one with horses, partner, but a fine opera company, a boon to the area. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. In 1921, Nebraska was the first state ever to appoint a poet laureate, John G. Neihart. You may rightfully ask, what is a poet laureate? Well, the tradition is Greek. Military heroes and poets were laureated by a laurel wreath signifying the god Apollo. The tradition was strong in England. Dryden, Wordsworth, and Tennyson were so honored. But here in the colonies, only about 19 states have their own poet laureate. One of the more famous ones is Gwendolyn Brooks, the poet laureate of Illinois. As that state's official poet, she's written inauguration poems and runs a poetry competition to encourage young writers. William Stafford, the poet laureate of Oregon, also pretty well known, and also works with younger poets to encourage them through an Oregon project called Artists in the Schools. Some states are trying to keep the post filled. A few others are looking for an official state poet for the first time. Nebraska set the pace some 50 years ago. Think how it would widen your state's parameter, adding a department of iambic pentameter. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. Artists who create very large sculptures run into a problem sooner or later. It's called space. 
Once they've filled up their studios and their friends' garages with massive works of art, if they're lucky, they'll go on to museums, city halls, or maybe shopping centers. Well, you lovers of large sculpture, there is hope. Laumeyer Sculpture Park near St. Louis is a full 96 acres dedicated to art out of doors. It all began in 1976 when sculptor Ernest Trova, a native of St. Louis, donated 40 of his large outdoor pieces. Later on, work by Louise Nevelson, Richard Serra, and Mark de Suvero were added to the collection along with a number of others. A total of 54 pieces are out there now. Now, there are other sculpture parks around the country, like the Storm King Center in New York State and Brook Green Gardens in South Carolina, but the Laumeyer Park near St. Louis is one of the few sculpture gardens created expressly as a permanent setting for art al fresco. I'm Gene Claven. This is Arts Minute. Knights in shining armor conjure up heroic images of jousting and chivalry and chastity. But really, going around in armor was not much fun. It could take hours to put on, and if you gained a few pounds, it was hard to find a tailor. What's remarkable about the armor itself is its craftsmanship. You can see some of these extraordinary pieces at the John Woodman Higgins Armory Museum in Worcester, Massachusetts. John Higgins owned a steel factory and liked fine craftsmanship. He didn't care about the romance of medieval warfare, really. He started collecting armor because of the romance of rivets. Mrs. Higgins told John to get all that armor out of the house. Higgins put up the museum atop his company offices so his workers could view the history of their craft. Today, it houses swords, crossbows, medieval paintings, carvings, and tapestries, and about 100 full suits of armor. On this one, the sleeves are out uh, in Detroit being altered. I'm Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. If you were a football coach, you'd know how to read this as a great play. This, this is part of a great play, too. This reads, to be or not to be, in Mandarin, now the Chinese national language. Any musician can tell you what this is. Da, 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 Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. But how do you preserve dance? Well, one way is called labanotation, named after its creator, Rudolf Laban. This center line represents the center of the dancer's body. This symbol means, now follow me, do this. This one means, do this all together, please. Over the years, lab notation has been refined, so it's just about as accurate as music notation. All together, here we go. Gene Claven for Arts Minute. El Greco is widely known for his paintings of biblical themes, but he was also strongly attracted to the cultural and religious climate of the Spanish city of Toledo. He settled there in 1577, and he created this vision of it called View of Toledo. Born on the island of Crete, his given name was Domenicos Theotokopoulos, but he signed his painting simply El Greco, the Greek. Art historians have commented on the development of his unusual style. 
They've proposed everything from bad eyesight to the use of emotionally tortured people as models. A major exhibit of El Greco's work assembles the largest number of his paintings ever. About half of them have never been seen outside of Spain. The exhibition opens in Madrid, then moves on to Washington, D.C., Dallas, Texas, and Toledo. That's Toledo. Uh, that's our Toledo in Ohio. That's right. I'm Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. There are some industrial designs that just don't work. Cars that have to be recalled. Smoke detectors that go off when you make pot roast. Copiers that break down at income tax time. But there are others that endure because they do work. And they're attractive as well. A number of objects like unusual cars, designer telephones, medium format cameras have been displayed at an exhibition space called the Boiler House Project at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Why do they call it Boiler House? Well, it so happens that this clean white gallery was once the basement boiler plant of the museum. Currently, there's an exhibition on the history of Japanese design. It won't tell you how to eliminate car production in other countries, but you'll learn about transistors and radios and electronic things. The Boiler House Project will also feature notable designs of household care products, cookware, lighters, other little indispensables that look good and actually work, too. I'm Gene Claven for Arts Minute. Two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Those lines are Robert Frost's, and this great poet of the New England countryside was actually born in San Francisco. His father, an editor and politician, rebelled against his ancestral New England, moved to California, and named his son Robert Lee Frost after the Confederate general. The father died when Robert was 10. The boy and his mother returned to New England. Frost discovered Emerson and Poe and started writing his own verse. His grandfather playfully told him, you'll have to promise to quit writing if you can't make a success of it in a year. Frost replied, give me 20. He was prophetic. 20 years later, almost in the month, his first book was published, A Boy's Will. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. He did, and it has made all the difference. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. Out on the old Double F Ranch near Dragoon, Arizona, you'll find the Amarind Foundation Museum, a source of American Indian art with careful documentation of its origins. Amarind was established by William Fulton, a Connecticut industrialist with a passion for archaeology and American Indian culture. While searching for a water supply deep in a cave, he came upon an 800-year-old ceramic jar. Now, this lucky find was the start of his Arizona collection. Perhaps he was a hobbyist at first, but through his dedication, we've ended up with an outstanding achievement. Many, many other priceless pieces have been added to the museum collection, each one documented as to origins and use. Now, that's the Ameren Foundation Museum in the absolute southeast corner of Arizona, right near the Coronado National Forest. Free tours are available on weekends, but they like it if you give them a call before you go out there. Here's a number, 602-586-3003. I'm Gene Clavin for Arts Minute.
Sculpture in public places used to mean bronze generals on horseback, but things are changing. For example, the town of Hattiesburg, Mississippi has commissioned a sculpture by Ed McGowan to celebrate their centennial year. This is a model of the proposed piece, a 30-foot high pyramid. At the right time of day, the metal bars project a shadow on the ground, which forms the date the town was founded and the founder's name. The artist got the idea from a Mayan temple, which uses a similar device to project a serpent shadow. McGowan has also been commissioned to create public sculpture on view in Washington, D.C., and this piece in Jackson, Mississippi, which celebrates the literature of William Faulkner. We want to thank Mrs. Sally Cleveland of Hattiesburg for giving us the idea for this Arts Minute. She called 800-325-0887, and you can too. Or write us with your idea, Arts Minute, Radio City Station, Post Office Box 1277, New York, New York, 10019. Let's hear from you. I'm Gene Clavin. Question, who's the greatest artist of all time? Da Vinci, Picasso, Walt Disney. You have one moment. Okay, who is it? Good answer. But if you ask me, I'd make it simple and say that nature herself has created some of the greatest art the world has ever known. Just look at these masterpieces. You won't find them in many galleries, but you will find them at the National Aquarium in Baltimore. They've got a tropical rainforest housed in a 64-foot tall glass pyramid an entire section of an Atlantic reef in a huge tank, and some modest exhibits like a 63-foot skeleton of a finback whale. Water covers 70% of the Earth's surface, so that makes this planet the biggest museum around, containing some of our most priceless natural treasures. You can see these and other treasures at the National Aquarium in Baltimore, and unlike works by da Vinci and Picasso, they can swim. Gene Clavin for Arts Who first mixed flour and water together to make pasta? Not Michelangelo or Anna Magnani, but the ever-incredible Chinese. They also invented paper in 105 AD by mixing plant fibers and water, dipping a sieve-like mold into a vat of the stuff and pressing it till dried. The basic process has changed little over the years. Special papers are in demand because artists produce posters or lithographs in limited numbers, and the paper their work is printed on is often as important to them as the work itself. It's important to art collectors, too, because if paper isn't made well, it doesn't last. Some sculptors are working with paper, like Catherine Clark of Twin Rocker Paper Mill. And these artists from Dieudonne Paper. Whatever you do with it, remember, it's been around for some time, thanks to the Chinese. By the way, another thing the Chinese invented was explosives. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. Not bad. Actually, it's one of Norman Rockwell's paintings. Born in New York City, he got his start doing illustrations for Boy's Life and other magazines, but it was in 1916 that his first cover appeared for the Saturday Evening Post, and it made his career. By 1946, he was far and away America's most popular illustrator. He did over 200 covers for the Post alone. Rockwell was a great pictorial storyteller, painting the common man, barbers, doctors, and druggists. He always worked from live models, and he kept about 200 costumes on hand in his studio, and he never faked a detail. If he needed an 18th century footstool, he got one and he painted just that. In Stockbridge, Massachusetts, you'll find his house. It looks like it belongs in a Rockwell painting itself. It's a museum now filled with his works, about 300 in the permanent collection, and they have special exhibitions, too. I don't know, just another pretty face. Gene Clavin for Arts Minute. Some irresponsible person has predicted that TV is going to replace literature, or at least books. If that happens, we'll have to be prepared to read TV as we read books. 
Of course, with TV, you don't have to worry about what's important or dramatic or dangerous. They always tell you this is important or dramatic or dangerous. They also use the camera for emphasis. For example, the close-up, where they tell you the things they really want to emphasize. So when you see the close-up, homosexuals in the privacy of their own homes read to each other. Secretary of State Haig is really a fun person, and his wife calls him Snuggy. You know that's inside stuff or extremely important. But when you see me out here in a medium shot or a long shot, this is a long shot, you know I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know. Hi, your favorite elected official is on the take. And I really mean it. Gene Clavin. Goodbye.